We are here today to um, look at um, or watch Tobias Friedrich talk about the life of an underwater photographer. Um, before he joins us, I just wanted to um, say a couple words about Insider Divers if you don't know us yet. Um, we're a travel company. We organized uh, scuba diving trips, all kinds, obviously land-based and liveaboard. We have them both. Uh, we also do specific trips like uh, wreck trips to Truck Lagoon or tech-specific trips or we have trips where tech is possible, where we have both wreck and tech. Um, we also do trips which are free diving only, like with whales, and we do specific trips which are photography workshops where we do only photography, which uh, could interest people like uh, all of you. Um, all of our trips are group trips, so we only run trips as groups, and there's always at least one expert or more joining you, uh, like myself or one of my colleagues or um, photographers or scientists, whatever we think is good, and they will manage uh, the itinerary and they will make sure that the itinerary uh, is special, is unique, uh, hard to organize yourself. Um, and in all of our trips, wherever we go, um, we always put focus on education and coaching, which means that we always have talks, we always meet with local people to have conversations about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the wildlife there uh, locally, or we will have training about photography, whatever, because we think uh, we should never stop learning. Whenever time we dive, we should learn about our environment. And uh, that's also how we started Insider Academy. Now that we have this uh, stupid virus that keeps us uh, at home, we thought it's good to start a webinar series. We've already done almost uh, 20 webinars, and this is now a new highlight that's to be us today. Just before I uh, welcome him in, I just wanted to mention a couple words about using Zoom in case you're new to it. Um, so uh, you are actually all muted and your video is off because it's a webinar and will be too much streaming in. I would like you to um, ask the Q&A and the chat for your questions. And the chat is more actually to talk with each other. So if you have specific questions, please put them in the Q&A. If you can't see them, you need to go into your um, webinar control, your Zoom control panel. And there is a Q&A button that looks like the one that I have here. And you can post your questions there. So Toby will be speaking um, and I will be asking him the questions so he doesn't have to read them off the screen. Um, you can put them in the chat. I'll keep an eye on that as well, but preferably put them in the Q&A. You can also uh, raise your hand. Um, so your raise your hand basically means you would like to actually personally ask a question with audio on. Um, and if that fits in, then I will activate that for you. Um, preferably keep it in the Q&A, though it's easier to manage um, and then we can put it uh, where it belongs. So, um, yeah, then I would say I'm going to ask Toby to join. I hope he's uh, still there. He was there just uh, earlier. Toby, are you there? Oh. Hey. Okay, can Welcome. you see me and hear me good? <laughs> I can see you. Nobody else can answer that, but uh, I think everybody should be able to see you. So, uh, yeah. Welcome. Great to see you here online. Thank you. Yeah, we normally see each other around the world on dive shows or somewhere diving. So, funny to meet digitally like this, huh? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And also, thank you so much, Simon, for the for the invitation to hold a webinar here. It's also the first time for me to hold something like this live. So please bear with me if not, uh, anything is maybe not running as smooth as usual. Yeah, but yeah. I try my best. <laughs> I'm sure you'll do fine. You're a pro. Yeah, <laughs> at least in underwater photography, but not yet in Zoom meetings. <laughs> well, well, I'm sure you'll manage well. Okay, so uh, you can start yes. your screen then, and then we'll um, we'll start your talk. Yes, as you know, or maybe introduced already, I'm Tobias Friedrich, and I'm an underwater photographer, and I do this full time as well for the people who don't know me yet or didn't meet me in person. Uh, so that's my only job, <laughs> and uh, at the moment a little bit difficult as well in this crisis time. But I'm also trying to do a lot of things um, as well as these webinars, and hope to reach you still. Um, for my main work, um, I'm doing a lot of different things, like, but I'm well known for my magazine work. So you can see it. I had some one or two covers already in the in the past. Um, in case you you didn't see them, just as an example. But I would like to start a little bit with my with my history. I know that some people already that that are here in this chat uh, know this already, but maybe. Um, I have still something new for those people who already seen this presentation or a little bit of this presentation. Anyway, I wanted to say that I also started with a little small compact camera in the beginning. Yeah, so with a ridiculous huge yellow strobe in the first time. So this must have been like 15 years ago or so. Yeah, at least 
uh, when I was also starting to, to dive or a few years after I started to dive. And my pictures in the beginning also didn't look really, really good as you can see here. Yeah, so this was one of my first pictures in the pool. And I just wanna emphasize or like to, to tell everybody that you can all do and get better in underwater photography is just a matter of the time and the enthusiasm you spend with this. Yeah, so the, the more time you spend with underwater photography and in the water, you can get better. So this is like how I did it. Yeah, so I just put a high priority on on, on the water photography, and I knew that I wanted to do something with this um, in my in my future, uh, like a decade ago. So uh, so I was putting a lot of time and effort into this, and now finally, of course, I can I can make a living out of it, um, out of the underwater photography. This is here a picture with um, Jan Haft and myself. I'm on the left, and Jan is on the right, and he is a very famous. Uh, nature documentary um, filmer and director, um, also cameraman in Germany. And I, here in this time, I did we did some shots together in Iceland for a TV program for German TV. So, um, if you're from Germany, um, you maybe already seen it. Like uh, Magisches Island, Magical Iceland was the name, or also Magic of the Fjords, which was already um, shown in TV in Germany. Just for your knowledge. Any questions so far, Simon, or can I continue? No, keep going. I'll, uh, I'll let you know when there are questions. Okay, cool, yeah. So everybody, um, of course, thinks that uh, my job is a dream job uh, as an underwater photographer. And of course, I love my job. I would never do something else. But um, it's maybe not the, as you expect, of course, in, in all parties or in all um, yeah, um, in all areas, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, this was super funny as well. This picture was also taken in Silfa in Iceland. But um, the next slides are a little bit fun now to see, and um, it's like what the society expects, what I'm, what I'm doing. Yeah. So this is, um, I think, what society expects, what I'm doing as an underwater photographer. Always like selfies, like in front of super nice. Um, uh, nature, like here in Raja Ampat, for example. Yeah? So I'm just living the life. Um, but this is the, what the magazines probably think what I'm doing all the time, <laughs> just relaxing in the pool or something. Um, this is that what the what the uh, what my sponsors think what I'm what I'm doing all the time, just surface breaks and resting and whatever. Um, this is what my mom thinks <laughs> what I'm what I'm doing. Yeah, always diving with uh, big sharks. And um, this is what my was my friends uh, think. What I'm what I'm doing always just going for for party and and a lot of drinks. Um, the next picture is what I myself is thinking. What I'm doing always like an epic sunset, uh, photographing orcas or something else. Uh, and but the next picture is what I'm really doing. Um, or a, a lot of time what I'm doing here in my office in my small office is of course I get a lot of invoices the tax lawyer wants to have something uh, I I need to send out the pictures for the magazines to work on the on the on the images write the text yeah so all the back office work of course you don't see because I'm doing this at home and this takes a lot of uh, work actually yeah so sometimes when I'm traveling a lot and I only have like one night at home or two nights at home in between travels, I had to have to work the night uh, to to make everything possible. Yeah, what the magazines are requesting, or what my customers are doing, or want want from me, and I have to send it out. And sometimes I only can do it from home. So this is also the life of an underwater photographer, as well as uh, that the meals are sometimes really great, especially in liverboards or in resorts. But if you sometimes have to self cook for yourself, and you only have a microwave and uh, uh, and the water cooker, you're dependent for two weeks on just some instant uh, um, noodles or something else, which is like in, what you can cook instantly or whatever. Yeah? So sometimes it's not the best and you just have to bear with what you, what you get actually. Um, yeah, also the condition. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I uh, just uh, was wondering, so do you do everything yourself or do you have assistance with anything? Like, do you have anybody helping you with any of your work? Um, let's say from an organizational standpoint? No, I'm doing everything by myself. Um, I do have an agent who is um, dealing sometimes with uh, clients. So that is a big help sometimes, but this is usually for bigger clients. 
um, or for bigger projects. But everything else, um, of course, I have to do alone because um, the rents or the payments um, of the magazines are sometimes good in comparison to what they, of the size of the magazines. So usually all the um, scuba diving magazines are special interest magazines, which um, unfortunately only have a very small readership. But for this, the salary is very good. But unfortunately, I can't, you can't make a living just out of magazines anymore, I would say. Yeah? Um, so this is also just a part from my income, what I, what, what I do. But yes, I do everything else the same. Yeah? Also, question, please, Simon, is the speed of the slides I'm clicking OK? Yeah, you want to take maybe two seconds before you say it. It takes a bit okay, of time good. until it comes in. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah? Um, Okay. Oh, um, so actually, uh, there's yeah. a question yeah. to your, if you go yes, back please. to your uh, to your office. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> uh, Manjula wants to know what that controller is that you have in the middle, the media mixer. Ah, okay. Yeah, this is it's called um, uh, Loop Deck, and this is like for Lightroom. It integrates with Lightroom, and this is like for sliders. There are a lot of sliders and buttons where you can immediately go to the to the Lightroom sliders or which will fit the Lightroom slider. So you can work on the images a little bit faster with this. Um, it's quite expensive, the tool. I thought it would be a nice time effort for me um, to, to, to save, but actually I don't use it anymore, to be honest. Um, so if you want to buy it and test it, yeah, I have one to, to sell. <laughs> No, um, you can you can try it and test it, yeah. And and I liked it um, for the. It's a nice gimmick, but for workflow optimization, optimization, I think it's not the best. I would say, yeah. But yeah, good, good, uh, good look, yeah. Good, okay. good spot on, yeah. That you that they discovered this one. We actually have another question in the meantime. I yes. think Fitz also here is. Uh, you said uh, your sponsors think you're sleeping, but you were sleeping in. Your sponsor's clothing so somebody would like to know which which brands are actually sponsoring you um scuba pro for example are my sponsors or i'm ambassador for scuba pro since a lot of years now uh, for dive equipment of course and i'm also ambassador for seacam housings uh the underwater housings and i'm also working with uh, keldan lights for example who also provide me sometimes a few lights so i can work with yeah so these are the the fixed partners or the bigger partners which i which i'm working with at the moment Cool. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I continue or? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So the next picture here was in Norway, also on a shot for a nature documentary. And um, of course, I also have to dive in ice. And here you can't see that my actually one arm of my wetsuit is ripped and I still had to get a uh, time lapse from 25 meters uh, with an already, I mean, the rip from the dive before and it was already completely wet inside my, my undersuit and I had to dive again with this um, with this wetsuit in like three degrees uh, Celsius of water. So sometimes you have to do things which are not nice, but obviously here I survived and I'm quite happy with this as well. Um, and the other example is here in Greenland. Um, I've uh, done three trips to Greenland already with uh, some diving at the icebergs. You will see some images later as well. And this was by far the most extreme conditions I had. It was minus two degrees Celsius uh, in the salt water. And sometimes we had up to 20, minus 25, minus 30 degrees Celsius um, up uh, on the on the surface, yeah, which was quite hard to stay warm in these conditions. But I think the images are quite nice from this uh, region. So yeah, sometimes you have to go and go over your um, your comfort zone, I would say, um, to get the shots what you actually want. Um, this is also a shot from a, from a nature documentary travel. These were actually, it's not all my baggage, but my baggage is on the right side with the, all the scuba pro cases and the pili cases. But this is a baggage from three people. But this is how we traveled a lot of times and moving to different spots and I pack and unpack everything again and again. So you really need to have some passion for this and you really have want to do this. Otherwise, you don't like to do this stuff. Yeah, And all the packing and all the... I mean, these are also super heavy 
um, bags, of course. Yeah, so we had, we had to take them around, of course, one million times from one side to the other side and whatever. Yeah. So this also comes as an underwater photographer, these, these things, what you usually don't see. Um, but you have to deal with this, of course. Yeah? But of course, sometimes you have really, really nice scenes and nice moments where they, these are really appreciated then. Um, uh, especially here in the Northern Lights, also with Jan, the, the, the filmmaker. And uh, yeah, so these are the, the good moments. What's the maximum uh, luggage you've ever had in a plane on a flight? What was the, the, the most amount that you the had weight. on your name? Weight. Yeah. Um, I would say around between 120 to 150 kilos, I would say. Uh -huh. I can't count it anymore. There was, I think, five bags with each 25 kilos at least, plus the hand luggage. To, 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 to things, uh, to bags and hand luggage as well, which are not very light as well as you know, Simon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. When you get there, you're pretty happy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Once you're there, you're pretty happy, but only if you're there, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All the way, the traveling part is actually the worst for me, especially you're probably one, of, one or two of you have already seen my now, uh, now famous legroom pictures in the planes where I take a picture of my legroom space in economy class, which is not always very nice. <laughs> Sometimes I get lucky and get an exit seat, but, some, uh, but most often not. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, so now I continue to speak a little bit about images and how I've done the images, or a little bit about the um, backstory of those. Um, so you're welcome, Simon, to interrupt me and ask uh, a few questions. Um, about these images, if you feel they are needed, and uh, but also I will talk a little bit about the making of. So you sh all should see the um, the split shot of the humpback whale, which is maybe one of my most recognized and most famous pictures I've done. Luckily, at the moment, it's in Lightroom um, Classic, the start screen. So <laughs> everybody who's who's using Lightroom Classic at the moment is seeing my image, which I'm very proud of, actually. And, uh, and happy about that so many people at least have seen my image in the world about it. But um, this was a very, very special encounter as well for me because it was the first humpback whale for me I've ever seen underwater. And it was actually also a very rare humpback whale because only 80, or he's one of uh, one humpback whales of 80 in total, which are cruising on the Arabic Peninsula in the Indian Ocean between the coast of Oman and Yemen. And these humpback whales, usually all the other humpback whales are migrating from the warm waters like the Caribbean to the Arctic or from like, let's see the South Sea, like from French Polynesia, for example, to the Antarctica or so. But these are not migrating anymore since 80,000 years. Um, the scientists say so they can be actually considered it's still to come I guess as a known species yeah so we were very happy to find one of these in the individuals and it was um, we went very slowly in the water snorkeling wise with this um, with this humpback whale he was in a little bay resting or swimming around we couldn't figure it out and um, he was the first time a little bit shy so we were like only very very um, carefully approaching um, the humpback whale, but then it becomes more and more, it becomes more and more uh, curious to see us as well. So he was swimming closer and closer and I was very happy to get some underwater shots finally, the first time for me of a humpback whale and um, did some shots underwater here and there and was happy already. But then, and this is the important point, I think also for, for you watching this um, at the moment is that um, I thought about my portfolio at that moment. Yeah, So like to get not only the same shots always like underwater swimming towards me or swimming past me or so so I always you always get the same shots if they are very similar from the perspective so I thought okay what's maybe missing and I thought okay what would, would have been great or what would be great to get is an um, split shot of this humpback whale yeah so I was trying this the first time um, with a vertical shot and I got some shots but then he slapped me with his fin actually yeah so he got the uh, with his tail fin, he got he slapped me actually. Uh, so he maybe wanted to just test what what I what I am uh, because you've probably never seen humans swimming on the surface uh, um, on the water yet. Um, but if a 30-ton humpback whale wants to play with an 85 kilo human, then that's not good for the human. <laughs> so I thought I broke broke my hand with this, like the the bone in the hand. But luckily it wasn't. It was just a big um, uh, how you say it like. Uh, 
whatever yeah so it, it, it hurt a lot <laughs> uh, but that was it and then the next time he passed i was a little bit not scared but i had a lot of respect already uh, already before as well but even more respect now for the for this animal so um i just took a few shots as, and as well this shot what you can see now um on the surface and that made it and then like one minute after or so i was out of the water in the zodiac again to not disturb the animal anymore but um this is i think a good point to say okay what else also in regular underwater photography, when you're with an animal or with a, or, on, or on a wreck, which is much easier, for example, try to think about perspectives. Uh, what all else perspectives can you do? Um, also, maybe if you do two dives on a wreck, for example, uh, watch your images and uh, check and see and think about it, what you could do else and what perspective is maybe nice. This also works in returning trips, for example, to uh, the Red Sea or, for example, where I do go a lot and I do a lot of workshops in the Red Sea. The customers or my, my, uh, the workshop participants um, are doing this um, again and again. So they are repeating because they still uh, want to photograph a specific wreck even better. And this is the same also with animals, yeah? But if you do, if you can react very quickly with this, this is even better to get more perspectives of, of this kind of, of shots. Um, was yeah, this but a commercial to, yeah. shot? Like, did you, did, you, did you go there for an assignment or? Um... Um, yes, it was an assignment for a magazine, for Tauchen magazine, actually. Um, so it was also a story about these whales in Oman in the Tauch magazine. Yeah? So before, of course, I clarified with the magazine that I'm doing a story. Um, and we knew that there were some humpback whales, but the chance to see them was very low. Yeah? So I was very happy at the end that I got the shot, actually, which was also the, a, a key shot and, uh, uh, for, this, for this story. How many days in the water? Uh, just, it was just a week's trip, actually, yeah? and this was the only time, the only half hour we we met a humpback whale there in, in Oman. Yeah? And I've never seen any um, more humpback whale encounters, more or like this is really, uh, I've seen some uh, or got some stories from, from people, but this was a very rare, rare encounter and we were quite lucky, actually, to, to meet the animal there. And uh, people are asking if you used... Um, uh ambient light or did you use any artificial lights yeah no only ambient light i was just with my with my housing and the super dome with the big dome port uh in the water i will also talk a little bit more about techniques when the next split shot is coming okay. in the presentation yeah, so. about split shots. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, somebody so, would like to know how adobe got this shot i know you told me this story but i think it would be great if you can tell people how this happened um, yeah, actually, and honestly, I don't know, <laughs> because um, I suddenly got an email from Adobe and uh, requesting for this image and asking for uh, an in-app use of this image, but I didn't know at this point of time um, for what they want to use it exactly. So uh, my agent dealt the price with them and for this, for this image, what they have to pay. But if I would have known that it was, would have been the... Lightroom classic start screen, I think I would have uh, uh, bargained a little bit to get more, more to get more money out of it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So but this was just, honor. just every, on maybe we're, we're sometimes. Looking, we're all looking yeah. at your picture every day, you know, every day we, yeah. all, every <laughs> we see your photo. So. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. It was very, very, for me, it also was very not scary, but uncomfortable for me to see my own image and my Lightroom startup screen. It could have been like a customized startup screen as well. You know? So uh, it was very weird at the beginning for me as well. <laughs> Good. So we can, can, I think we should continue to the next yeah. picture. Um, um, how long can I speak, by the way, Simon? Yeah. Or what, yeah, when you, would you like to this at the end? 25 minutes. I'll, I'll just, um, you know, give you some relevant questions and then we'll do some more questions at the end. Okay. Perfect. We'll do so, yeah? I think nobody can. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, so this was one of the pictures from the freediving series I did last year, uh, almost exactly one year ago in Greenland as well, with a freediving uh, record uh, from a record holder, Anna von Bötticher, um, the German freediver. And I was with her in Greenland, and we did some shots together on the icebergs. It was 
um, not really planned. She was like, not as an accident on this trip, but she, I found out only a few months before that she was also on that, on this same trip because she has been to Antarctica before and there the conditions were not so nice and she wanted to really badly dive, free dive on icebergs. And uh, then we found out that we're together on this trip. And so it was like, okay, perfect. Let's do something together. And um, for me, first, this was just a side project in Greenland because I wanted to photograph icebergs, um, of course, under the fjord, under the frozen fjord. Um, but the, after the first shots with Anna, we saw that um, this was really, really nice and the pictures are coming out nicely. So um, this series was really going around the, the world at the moment, this Friday free diving series. Also mostly done with ambient light. I had a few strobes with me, but um, just to give a little bit more light for the for the for the front, not to to really sometimes highlight the icebergs. So, so just to give a touch of light um, for 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 the button. I even sometimes switched off the strobes completely to just get the whole atmosphere um, of the icebergs under the ice. Yeah. Any questions to this picture? I don't see any specific question to it, but I think everybody is really amazed. I get lots of wows and amazings, and uh, people are really uh, okay, impressed cool. with that. Oh wow! Look at that. That's good. Yeah. Here's also a little making off of that image. Um, so Anna one time dived down and hacked into me or, and I did a little selfie uh, with this. So you can see me in full dry suit, clothes, everything what goes I had underneath, like all my clothes I had, uh, maximum, maximum warm. And she only had a six millimeter wetsuit, uh, wet suit, I have to say again, yeah. <laughs> so she was super brave to dive in this minus two degrees. Um, of course, she couldn't stay very, very long, like I would say 15 to 20 minutes from one dive after she had to, or like not one dive, in, but in 15 to 20 minutes in the water with like, I would say around about 10 dives uh, for like one or one and a half minutes. And uh, this for maximum two times a day. Um, so how long uh, of a break would she take at the surface? So she would do like a minute or two dive and then how long would she take a break at the surface? Yeah, also maybe only one minute or two oh. minutes maximum, yeah, just to okay. get a get a breath and then go down because of course she knew that I was also waiting downstairs and if you're just waiting in minus two degrees of water, then it's also not, uh, it's get, it gets of course very cold very quickly. Yeah? So for me, usually after 45 minutes, it was a break um, I can push it to, to an hour or an hour 15 maybe, but then you get really cold and you're probably not going to do a second dive or a third dive afterwards. You were alone underneath the water waiting for her? Um, yes, we are for the shots. We've been alone, um, just uh, her and me, um, because uh, and even without a security line, because this would be really nasty in the picture or in the videos we also took. We took a, also a nice video for, for this. So you can, you're welcome to check my YouTube channel for the, for the video for this dive um, as well. And um, yeah, no, so uh, what was the question? <laughs> Uh, well, the question the question was how long she stayed at the surface, and then if you had oh, yeah. diving alone. But so, did you have somebody oh, yes, at the no. top op keeping the ice hole open, or? Um, yes, we had somebody, some support at the top, of course. Also, other divers waiting um, who also wanted to dive. So we took turns in um, in the dives as well, and of course, some people were looking for security. But it was not that quick that um, the ice is um, growing again on the surface. So. Um, it, it was not necessary to hold the ice hole open. Yeah? So, and also we had several holes uh, in it, maybe three to four at least, so you can also exit in, in other ways. And actually one time, Anna, she was surfacing too early um, a little bit and she couldn't find the exit hole again. Yeah? And, uh, and this was the point where we needed to trust each other very good because I saw, I didn't look at my images, so I was following Anna. Um, at least with my eyes a little bit so she could make a good exit and I was seeing already that she is she won't make it because she can't see the hole to uh, um, anymore and um, I was swimming very fast to her a um, bit nervous as well I have to say and but she was super relaxed and at the time when she realized that she couldn't see the hole she was just looking at me and me just like pointing okay to the hole and that was it basically yeah. so I think she was super calm super relaxed with this situation a little bit new for her as well, maybe, but at the end we, we managed this. And this is like the trust what you need to have in those situations or in those um, extreme conditions, extreme ice conditions that you just need to trust each other, of course, uh, for, for um, 
the um, for, uh, especially if you're diving without a security line. Yeah. Cool. Good. So to the next picture then. Um, this was also one of my um, macro shots, which won a lot of times or a lot of contests already. Um, also a long time ago, I took this shot. Uh, it was on a regular reef dive in Egypt, land-based dive. We went there super simple with the bus going in via the beach into the waters. Regular, reg regular reef dive. I was there with my macro lens and I found the uh, Pink-eyed goby, it's called, um, these two fishes. I found one, the lower one, on, sitting on top of this um, hard coral, of this Acropora, and usually they're sitting there to catch uh, nutrients out of the water or particles, what they're eating out of the water. And I was, I thought that is a nice um, setup, how he's sitting there, and um, I got ready for the shot. And in the time when I was ready for the shot, the second one came and just hopped on, each, on, on the other one, and I was like, okay, that's even better. And took a few shots, like two or three shots. And then the, the um, upper fish was already gone. Yeah, so in the situation was over. So um, what I wanted to say with this is that you, um, it's good if you're prepared for those shots. And if you're in the middle of something and something happens with a fish or if they do a sudden um, behavior, then it's nice to be ready with the right settings and just take the shot as well. Huh? So just do it. And of course, it's a, at the end, a little bit of luck that the, especially working with animals and fish, that they come in this direction as well, or that they swim, of course, and that they do it. Uh, like also for the frogfish, um, that they're yawning in the right moment when you're there and that you're not out of um, deco time or that you're maybe not into deco or um, but if, that if you're out of button time, I wanted to say, yeah, for example, yeah, so you need to be there, but you can hire your chances, of course, um, if you go more often diving. The more often you go diving, the more often you dive, the more often you take your camera with you, the better are your um, chances to get a really, really nice shot, especially a behavior shot. Are you using a strobe here? Is the question? Or yes, what? two strobes, actually, yeah, two strobes from the front, very simple setup. And is it a, what is it, a Canon 100 millimeter? Uh, yes, Canon 100 millimeter on the full frame camera. Yeah? So I'm using a uh, 1DX Mark II now, a Canon 1DX Mark II full frame camera. And before I was using a, a Canon 5D Mark II uh, for all my shots. So all the shots you, 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 you see at the moment are either taken with a 5D, if the pictures are a little bit older, and the newer ones are all taken like the last three years or so with a 1DX Mark II. Cool. Or any more questions to this image? Or otherwise I continue? No, yeah, you answered that already. Good. OK, cool. Um, so you all see the mantas now uh, with the backlight. Um, this was also a shot which um, uh, won a lot of contests or was placed uh, in a lot of contests. Um, this was also a similar situation like with the humpback whale, not in terms of uh, rarely seen species, but more of changing perspectives. And um, this was in the Hanifaro Bay in the Maldives, in the Baratol, very famous for, for manta rays. Um, nowadays, I think this was also taken some longer time ago when it was still possible to dive and they were still allowed to dive in the Hanifaro Bay. Now you can only snorkel with a life vest on, which of course will hinder you or will you, you will not be able to take a shot like this, unfortunately, um, in this bay, but maybe somewhere else where an aggregation of manta rays is if you want to take a similar shot. But um, for this example, I was trying to avoid all the people who were also with me in the water and I was swimming a little bit far away where I saw the mantas also always aggregating. So they were always swimming from one to the other direction and I was all just changing my, my, my position, going to the other direction where less people are and also changing my perspective to just photograph upwards into the sun because I, actually the plan was to get one manta um, in front of the sun so with all the sunlight going through as you can see here as well but at the end there were nine mantas or eight to nine mantas in this picture coming and all swimming together in front of the camera uh, which I also took of course yeah <laughs> I mean one nine are better than one um, and I was happy to to get them all in the frame at the same time so this is actually not even um, cut um, the picture so it's not cropped it's the original um, I only cropped it from the top and the button to fit it to six and to nine now, but um, the original image is exactly this crop, yeah, so I didn't crop it anymore. And which lens so are you using? Which lens? The eight to 15 millimeter fisheye lens from Canon. 
Um, I was 15. using only 15 millimeters. Okay. Yes, at 15 mm -hmm, for full frame. And um, you're using which strobes for these shots? Um, this was um, still taken, I think, with my old iClight um, strobes with the iClight 160. Um, um, and um, now I'm using the, of course, the Seacam CFlash 150D, which are much better now than the iClight, I have to say and super fast and have also super good light on top there. So for all my, since I don't know, like now eight years, I'm using uh, only Seacam setup. This is older than eight years. Yes, it's maybe nine years old or so, just before the change actually, okay. to Seacam. Cool. Yeah. And the next image is one more of the split shots, uh, which you can also do, uh, for example, with me in Egypt in my underwater photography workshops, which I'm giving there. Um, not at the moment, of course, but <laughs> uh, they will come uh, soon again, um, I hope, when it's open. But this was um, a very nice reef near um, Sharm el Sheikh in, in Egypt, in the north of Egypt. And there you have really superb, nice reefs uh, that are really close to the surface where you can take shots like this. But the um, problem with split shots is also that you also need a part um, above the surface, which is also nice. So this is usually the struggle what you have in split shots, or if you want to take split shots, that you maybe have a nice underwater landscape or you have a nice top side landscape, but those are not matching together. So you need to find the location and the position to match both together. And as in Egypt, especially in this region, the top side is not so nice, especially not in this direction. So we do it in the sunset, which is also very nice. You can also do it in the, in the morning and the sunrise, but I'm more an evening person, I have to say. <laughs> so I take it, I rather like to have it in the sunset and um, take the images then. So can you uh, maybe mention about the domes? We had a question also with the whales earlier, um, you know, the yes. advantage of the, do the larger size domes. And maybe also yeah. just another question that was earlier, generally, how do you prepare your dome for such shots? Okay, cool, yeah. Um, so the, the thing is, if you want to do split shots, the mo um, you need to photograph exactly in between the wave, as you can see here. and. Um, the smaller your dome port is, the harder it is to have the wave exactly in this movement, so to say. Yeah? And the bigger your dome port is, the more size it has, and the wave has just more way um, to go up and down. Yeah? So um, if you can, for those split shots, take a dome which is as large as possible to make it easy as possible. Yeah? It's not said that you can't take it with a small dome, but it's just much harder and you just need more time, maybe. Um, to do it, but sometimes you just don't have more time as here in the sunset, for example. Um, you have to take it um, on one go uh, with this, with this, of course. And um, I prepare, or when I'm in the water, for example, um, a split shot to get rid of the drops, which are usually in the top part um, of the picture. Um, I just spit on my dome port, yeah? So I turn the camera around, spit on the top part of my, of my dome port, with just as you would spit in your mask, and then just rub it in the, on, the, on the first half a little bit and then just dunk the, camera and dunk the camera into water a little bit so that it rinse the water from the, from the dome pot um, down a little bit. And so you can get rid of most of all droplets actually. But you have to do this again every couple of minutes because the spit will, will, re, will be removed easily. Yeah? But you can get rid of most of the drops um, with this technique. Um, at the end, if you still have a drop, it's very easy, I have to say, to remove it in Lightroom or in Photoshop um, afterwards. Yeah, do you want to say anything to Lightroom? I mean, the, the obvious thing is that they picked your whale shot because split shots are particularly well edited in Lightroom, right? Exactly. Yeah. So this is in, especially in Photoshop or in Lightroom or with both tools together, you can really nicely and precisely edit those split shots because of course you will have either um, a too dark um, down part or a below surface part or a um, too bright top side part. Yeah. So you need to get to, to fix it a little bit and to um, separate the dimensions or the worlds. Yeah? So you need to work on the lower part separately to the top part um, to get um, this nice and equal shot as seen here. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And um, the next shot 
There's a okay, simple yellow I'm mouth. Sorry, I'm just going to oh, sorry. Sorry. because Frank is just asking if you tried like a chemical treatment for the dome. Um, yeah. Yes, I did. Um, I also tried a rain axe, which is for car windscreens, usually to rub it before. And then this lasts actually longer. So if you have it with you, like a little box of, of this car axe, so you just put it on the dome pot as, as you would do the split and then rub it in. This would, could also help, but it also doesn't last that long. I would say it lasts maybe 20 to 30 minutes in the water and then this effect is also gone and you don't have it always with you. And I don't want to carry one more thing as well, especially going with, for, for split shots or so. So I just use this bit, which is always available, which is natural which um, is biology, by bio product, of course, yeah? So it doesn't, if it goes in the water, it doesn't make um, any damage, of course, which is also important nowadays, I would say. And it's, it's just, yeah, easier to do and to deal with, I would say, yeah. Cool, I've never tried that. I've tried uh, dishwashing detergent. And then I, and yeah, I, okay. I take a small bottle and I've just put it in my wetsuit. Uh, but <clears> it yeah. doesn't last even five minutes. It goes away so quick. Yeah. And uh, yeah, exactly, it's always yeah. questionable if it's good for the reef. Uh, exactly, yeah. So I would say split is the best the option. Best, yeah. And if, if I, I would say also for the nature, and if not, uh, if it's even if it's not maybe the best option, it's the best option for the nature. So we should do this, I would say, instead of artificial projects, uh, products. Cool. Let's move on. <clears throat> okay, so on the next image is uh, also very uh, not. Uh, or, or one moray eel, which is a common moray eel, not in maybe in every waters so in all waters, but um, I photographed it with a snoot and with a trioplan lens, which means a projector lens to get out these bubbles a little bit more. Um, so you can see it maybe uh, that only the eyes are quite sharp, but everything else is uh, not really sharp in this image, just a bit of the mouth maybe, but the effect for the bubbles is most with this special um, Trioplan lens, which is, was former projector lens uh, from Meyer Görlitz, a German lens manufacturer. But now they have also new versions, quite expensive, I have to say, and all manual, so manual aperture, manual focus and everything. Um, and it's quite hard to deal with it underwater, but the results are sometimes really nice, as you, I think, here, can you can, can see here. Um, I believe this is a nice image. <laughs> And um, also for different perspective, or the, the point is what I wanted to say is like, um, don't always try the same lenses or the same settings, but also try around with different set lenses. Yeah, Maybe a lens which is not made for underwater and take it underwater to experiment. Uh, so there's nothing wrong about experimenting underwater or in photography. Um, the most negative thing you can have is that the picture is not good and that you have to, to delete it. But as we're living in a digital age, it's um, for free that you can delete the image. And, uh, but it's, I think you gain a lot of experience with trying out and experimenting and also going over your comfort zone with this image. And this is one of, one of the examples and I'm hating this lens yeah, because it's so hard to do pictures with this but if you got a nice setup and if you get a nice um, location or a nice position a nice subject for it then it really it's a huge benefit. So um, I, I've, I've never used the trio plan but I've looked at it and I always shied away from the price it's really quite pricey but um, do, yeah. so you do you set one focal distance and then you just move the camera or um, do you actually have a way yes. to to... Yes, I, in the beginning, I was just set, setting a focal distance, which was the closest or something in between the closest and the middle. But now I got a um, focal ring for my Seacam housing wow. um, to do this at least. Um, but before I was also shooting in um, just manual focus, one focus distance, and that I just had to move the housing back and forth until I can find the right distance, which is still the case. So, so even you can't, um, of course, the, the autofocus is much, much uh, faster for, for nature photography. And if you have to um, all the time focus again in your housing, then it's also you. It's almost impossible with a moving subject. Yeah? But if something is really calm, like this Mori eel, I could try a little bit and test with the, with, the, with the focusing. So this was a good case. James Emery is uh, offering to do you 3D print gears for any of your future lenses. Oh, cool. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> that's highly appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Cool. Um, 
So the next image was also a um, um, quite hard to get image actually. So this is the inside of one of the wrecks in, in Egypt in the Krizula Kar it's called. And this is the machine room. And um, I'm coming at the end to one more picture uh, from the from the Sisselgorm um, also. But um, this is another example of doing a panoramic image. Like that means I took several images for five, I would say seven to eight in this case images and I stitched them together. I merged them in Lightroom, which you can actually easily do. Um, maybe not the first time in a machine room, but if you've got a reef or something else, or even if you're bored at home and want to do a panorama of your living room, for example, you can just do it and just take a few images try um, make sure that they overlap a little bit the images and then you can just merge them in Lightroom. So you just mark the images, right click on it, merge and then panoramic and then automatically Lightroom will fit them together or try to fit them together. And if you shot, shot it in a good way, um, then they will merge. And if you don't shot it in a good way, try it again. <laughs> and this was also happening to me in this machine room, for example. So I tried a few, I had to try a few um, perspectives until I got the shot that I wanted from this perspective um, and with a lot of lights actually um, in the background. So for this shot I used six lights, mostly Keldon lights, uh, which are super nice, which are super nice video lights, but I also had some Sea Life Sea Dragon lights with me, which I use for the for the small Sea Life camera as well. So they're also good of course for lightening up wrecks uh, in the dark and this is actually what I do a lot also in my workshops in, in Egypt, uh, not necessarily with a panoramic view, but um, to just give the, the inside of the racks, the cargo decks or the machine rooms, a little bit more of atmosphere, a little bit more space. Um, so you can feel how it maybe would have been in these times when the boat was still operating, yeah? just to give more atmosphere, more life to the whole image and not to make it black because usually if I would have just lightened that with my front strobes on the same image, you don't get, um, you maybe get the light, the blue light in the background, but you don't get the 3D dimensions or the 3D of this, of this image. So I choose to place a lot of lights in the machine rooms um, to um, give it just more atmosphere and more, more living, more background, more perspectives, more, more layers of the image. So to say, and uh, you're shooting in in uh, in vertical mode, I guess. Like yes, like all in vertical mode. Yeah. Just a few images. But are you using fisheye still? Yes, with the fisheye on 50 millimeters as well, uh, with the lens and just a few shots to all the directions. Make sure that you don't have a shutter speed too slow as well, otherwise you will just. Um, I have not a crisp image, and uh, usually I have a little bit of light from my from my strobe lights as well with this. So here you have strobe light because I can't really see where you have the strobe light. A little bit, yes, yeah, from the front, a just bit. a bit, mm -hmm. just a bit. And are you using a high ISO to get the uh, yes, yeah. background light? Yes, yeah, to get the background light, to get the blue from the background and also the other lights. I'm, I think I'm here on at least ISO 2500 wow. and also on open aperture. That means like four or I think it was maybe 4.5, 5.6 maximum. That's where you have the 1DX for. <laughs> Yeah, but you can also do it with um, with a 5D, um, I guess. Yeah, so I had my my 5D also pushed up to 3,200 ISO in some circumstances, and that was still okay, I have to say. And how do you treat the noise? So you can, especially with the Lightroom denoise, with the Lightroom denoise, yeah. um, it's very nice to to do this. So you can get rid of a lot of noise inside the pictures, and also I would say it's better to have an image with a lot of noise then no image or an image which is way too dark, which you can't do anything with it. Yeah. So, um, and the grain from, or the noise or the former grain in, in film times, it was also in, in stylistic um, art form to do a lot of grain inside your images. Yeah. So I don't, if it, if the images have a little bit of grain or a little bit of noise, and I think it's still okay. Okay. I think great inspiration for many people. We get lots of comments where people are very, uh, excited about this. Um, there's one question about yeah. um, placing uh, your lights. You know this site, obviously, before you go in. So you already know <clears throat> yeah. where you're going to put your lights, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then this is actually the trick um, or the, the big question is how to place the lights behind these, these things. And this you can learn in my workshops, for example, um, or I will, can tell a little bit more because this would go over the time we have now, um, I would say. But um, this is actually the trick part. 
where you have to put it in the way in the right in the right way to still to make this atmosphere actually yeah so there's also a lot of ways how to not do it and how to not place the lights but this comes also with um, experiences and visiting the same dive sites more often Teresa is wondering how you got it without divers uh, I was just waiting. <laughs> but this was the other problem that, of course, this is a super um, known dive site and a lot of divers come there. So um, I had to <laughs> wait until really all divers were, were gone away. Yeah? And I, one time I had like my lucky 20 or 30 minutes without anybody in the machine room where I took the picture. Wow, really, really great one. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> and also this orca, for example, was in Norway, uh, shot in Norway. And um, if you have seen the um, split shots before, you saw maybe that all the um, top side, for example, of the image is very crisp and very sharp. And here you can see it's really blurry. That's because on split shots, you usually have an aperture. Uh, you usually should shoot in an aperture as high as possible. Um, that means to get all the image very uh, sharp. That means from the downside, from the from the lower part to the topper part, um, because of the distraction of the light, it's a physical thing. Um, if you photograph something in the water, it will be very close to the camera and everything what's above the water will be very far in the distance. And if you hire the aperture, that makes um, the camera um, crisp from very close to very far. Yeah? So the higher your aperture number is, that means 18, 20, um, for example, the more um, sharpness you have in the whole image. And this is also needed for split shots. But here in this case, it was not the case because um, I was photographing here in the very dark environment. The orcas in northern Norway, where it's not much of a light, especially the, um, the water is super dark and super black. And um, so I was also shooting on ISO 3200, I think, and on open aperture 4.0. This is why I only got the orca quite sharp. Um, but nothing else in the image, but also here, and this is also the point or the learning point in this um, image is I rather have the orca crisp and sharp, uh, like the main subject in the picture than everything else. So I can lose also, I can, also it was super grainy, as you can see also the quality is not very, very good in this image. Um, I had to push down the, or I had to denoise it a lot as well, um, because it was just maxed out and, and, and limited in camera wise as well. Yeah, it's an amazing picture. Just the colors, really amazing. Fabulous. Yeah. Um, and also sharks are also a very nice subject um, to photograph, of course, usually. But this is also um, the, like, uh, the learning point here is also, I want to say that also with a lot of experience, that means if you dived a lot with sharks, especially with really um, curious sharks like this um, oceanic white tip shark, which comes can come very close to, to divers, then um, the more often you do this, the better you are in shooting sharks as well, because you get calmer and calmer while doing this. And you already got some shots of, of oceanic white tips. So the more shots you have of one subject, the more relaxed you are with the next situation, especially with a fast moving shark um, like this. So this is what I recommend as well. If you want to really shoot sharks, you, like the first time, my first shot of an oceanic white tip was also crap. <laughs> and, uh, but the more often I could had the chance to do this, the, the better the images will be. Do you know what, app, uh, what shutter speed you're using here? What shutter speed you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, it was only a 25th of a second because had, it has a little bit of blur, which I wanted to freeze the image with, um, with my strobes or to freeze the shark with my strobes inside the image. And then I had a little bit more shutter speed, so I get a little bit more of uh, movement here from the shark, which makes it more um, dramatic or more living, the, the, the picture, I would say. Yeah, and dynamic. Just have this shadow. And dynamic, yeah. Movement. Thank you. It's really great, yeah. Exactly. But not only uh, wide angle images, I think also in macro photography, you can do a lot, um, especially in subjects where you maybe don't see any animal or so. I think this picture, which I'm showing now, works also as a very nice structure, a uh, very nice um, like, like uh, a surface of a sea star in this, in this times. But if you photograph it in a good way, 
then this can also make a lot of it out of it. Yeah. So you don't always need sharks, you don't always need the big icebergs or wrecks to photograph. Yeah. It can also be like the super simple things which can be super, super nice to, to photograph as well. Yeah. So always if you I have a lot of dives where I can't find anything really special, especially in macro dives or so when everybody's just looking around. So I concentrate on structures um, and um, patterns to photograph, which can also be very, very nice and add up to your portfolio, to your general portfolio as well then. Any question to this image? No, no just keep going. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm, let me just say one thing, uh, everybody, we're approaching uh, one hour. Uh, Toby already said before that he doesn't have a time constraint, neither do I. Um, so if you guys only took one hour out of your day to join us, then uh, I apologize, but we're just gonna do a little bit longer. Um, because I think there's uh, lots of interest and we're not done yet. I know there's quite a few more photos coming that are really, really worth watching. So, uh, Toby, just take your time. I think nobody's dropped okay. out yet. So um, <laughs> most people are stuck at home and uh, are happy to look at uh, photos. So I'm getting lots of comments here that people are, they are happy for you to continue as long as you like. So uh, let's okay, just uh, keep going um, and take our Very time nice. because uh, everybody's learning a lot, which is great. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, sorry for me talking so so much <laughs> about things. <laughs> um, okay, so the next image um, was, I think, uh, for me, it's a very nice image. Um, I like it a lot because it's done in an area where usually you don't see this kind of images. It, it's in the middle of uh, Raja Ampat in the Dampier Strait. And usually nobody is uh, taking care of the all the nice big animals in that area. Um, like these spinner dolphins and we just found them and took the chance and uh, we couldn't dive with them because usually spinner dolphin dolphins are super shy and uh, very quick away uh, from anybody who is slipping or touching the water. So we were just driving with the Zodiacs and I was just basically holding my camera in the front of the Zodiac and just trying to put it underwater and to take some blind shots actually. Yeah? So I was not I didn't know what I was shooting. I just had a rough guess on where the dolphins are and was just trying to catch some, some, some nice shots. And this was one of the best images what came out afterwards where all the group was together. These are almost uh, 80 um, dolphins. I counted one time. Um, but afterwards I got a really bad sunburn because I forgot to take any sun cream. And um, it was actually quite hard to hold the camera while the Zodiac was driving. Yeah? So it was only very, very slow moving, but um, I had a hard time to actually hold it. And if you lose your camera while doing this, then you're, I think, fucked really. Yeah? <laughs> oh, sorry, my language. Yeah? But then you're really in deep trouble, I would say. Yeah? Um, and, but this sometimes gets you to, to a point. You have to risk a little bit as well, like in terms of equipment maybe, to get to a point where you can actually shoot some images and also nice images. Yeah? This was the point what I wanted to say. And this, I think, is a, a good example uh, for those people who are asking if it's necessary to upgrade to an SLR. This is only what a fast camera with an autofocus can do, where you just do multi... Did you use multi-point autofocus, I guess? Um, yes, I think here I was switching to multi-point to get anything what's in the picture because I couldn't see it, I couldn't point. So it was automatically tracking where the focus should have been or, or, or was, yeah, correct. If you, have a, if you have a good camera, and now actually the mirrorless cameras are coming to that, the A7, for example, and I'm sure the R5, that you can actually focus blindly and that will allow you to do a shot like this. With a compact camera, you will not ever be able to do a photo like this. So um, I think that's one reason to upgrade if people are thinking about it, is high action photos like yeah. this, I think not possible, right? Yeah, especially if you have something in the blue, like a dolphin, and the um, outside is not really, I mean, it's really difficult usually for cameras or for compact cameras or cameras which are not so expensive to focus into the blue on a shark or onto a dolphin. Yeah, so I can see that many autofocuses are struggling with this. So if you have a DSLR, this is much better. And of course, my 1DX, it's perfect. It's, uh, have, that the camera has a perfect um, focus, especially on this um, low light or low contrast settings, um, but any other DSLR will do a much better job, I have to say, also for than a, than a mirrorless or a compact camera. Yeah, cool. Yeah. 
Um, the next um, shot is was also done this year um, recently in January. I've been in um, Alilao to shoot some more Blackwater stuff, and this is really what I can also recommend for especially for anybody who's interested in underwater photography um, to do a Blackwater dive or a trip. Um, um, I also do have one coming up, hopefully, <laughs> end of the year or beginning of next year, again in Anilao, like a workshop contest thing uh, with Mike Bartik in, um, in the Crystal Blue Resort in Anilao. I'm doing this. So for anybody who has seen everything on the water already or haven't done a blackwater dive yet or is interested, I can really recommend it. It's like a treasure hunt underwater, uh, even more like on a regular macro dive, but you do these blackwater dives over without a reef, yeah. So in case anybody doesn't know who's what a blackwater dive is, so you don't see you don't see the reef. You just go um, on a line with a lot of lights attached to it and around this line, but over very deep water. So a few hundred meters or a few thousand meters even deep, and you will always be in this area between five to twenty-five meters, I would say, and dive and look for things like this, like this paper nautilus. Um, this is one of the unicorns of uh, on the water di um, blackwater diving. And I was really happy to find one here um, sitting on a palm leaf. And this is also the case also with hiring the chances. Um, I was looking, before I did the trip, I was looking for resorts who are offering two blackwater dives every night. So a double tank dive every night to do to a blackwater site to just maximize my my output afterwards. So I had to do also a magazine story about blackwater diving. And I also wanted to have some blackwater dives in my portfolio. So I was choosing or I contacted Mike, um, I contacted a few other resorts before who wouldn't offer um, two tank dives, but only one black water dive, and maybe not also every night, but Mike is also super keen to, to go for black water. So he is really on, on to it. So he's offering two dives um, every night for black water to get as much encounters as possible. Yeah, because also here, sometimes you just get nothing from a, from a black water dives. And on some dives you get everything yeah so like not only one paper now those but maybe five and wonder Puss and diamond squid all the nice unicorns what you what you would like to photograph you sometimes get in one dive and this was a fantastic dive so it's just about hiring the chances the more often you go into the water you, the more often you try to photograph something the better your chances are to finally get the shot what you want and black water is really a little bit like an addiction right like once you start yeah, <laughs> it just, it, you just want to go again and again and again. Exactly. Yeah. This is, was I, I have to be honest. In the beginning, I wasn't very keen to go at Blackwater because this was rising and all the underwater photo contests. Um, there were a lot of people winning with Blackwater pictures and I kind of didn't like it anymore because everybody was doing it. So I was like, nah, I don't like it any, really, but I had to shoot it because for a project, for this magazine, for my own portfolio, for another reason, I had to shoot it. And once I did it, the first dives, I was really super addicted to it. And now every time somebody offers somewhere a blackwater dive, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> I find now very often when I do normal just night dives, I just swim into the black and look for blackwater stuff because it's more fun. I, it's more this yeah. hunt, this looking for something special is... I don't know, it's more unique. Um... Definitely, definitely. And also these animals, especially like the paper nautilus, which is now on the, on, the, on the screen, you only, this is a pelagic animal. That means it doesn't enter the reef. Um, so you only get it with these blackwater dives to see one of these nice octopuses. Yeah? So you see total different nightlife, total different things than you would do on a reef dive. And this is, I think, what makes it really special and interesting. Um, somebody's asking, what is the good starting point for settings in Blackwater? It's a tricky question, I know, but what, what is your yeah. starting point usually for Blackwater? <clears throat> it's so, it totally depends on what, ca what camera you have and which sensor you have, but I would rather usually start with an aperture not too high, but also not too low. So something like uh, 13, uh, 14 is a nice start, uh, or 16 maybe uh, as, an, as an aperture wise, and then the speed you can take to a 200th of a sec, like the maximum sync speed your, your camera can do, and then put your put your strobes also depending on the power, maybe on half or on quarter power, um, not overpowering it. Um, this is also very, very difficult sometimes yeah, and that you can shoot a lot of times so that the recycling time is very low, but also um, that you don't light it up too much. Yeah? So in black water photography, it's good to um, have a little bit lesser, less light from your, from your strobes so, so you can turn them down at least one aperture as, as usual, one 
like if you usually have them at half, you can put them on the quarter and then it's very good actually. How do you uh, get started with, uh, Angelina is asking, how do you get uh, started with blackwater diving? Like, how do you learn? What's your suggestion? Um, uh, in general, if somebody wants to do this, you mean? Yeah. Just if somebody's um, never done it before, like, what do you suggest? Um, I would say go to a dive center who's experienced with this. Um, this is really necessary in my eyes because I've seen a lot of dive centers who are doing it not the correct way, which could be potentially dangerous. For example, this um, line, what you have in the water during the blackwater dives where all the lights are attached on the top is a little buoy or something like a floating device, which holds it up. Um, but this is floating free through the water. Uh, so taken with the currents and this is um, the most important thing that the divers are also flowing automatically with the current so underwater in this system you don't feel any current um, but you it can be that you're pushed for for a kilometer or so yeah by the current but if you attach if you would attach this buoy to the diving boat for example then the wind direction could could be a different one so the boat is taken off in another direction than the current and then the divers are struggling to keep up with the, um, against the current to the line and this can be really dangerous yeah so um, it really there are some specific things to to know about blackwater diving so i would strongly recommend um, dive center can be anywhere can be in anilao can be lembe strait can be in bali for example where i've done a lot of blackwater dives as well um, which they know what they're doing basically yeah or which have done a lot of blackwater dives already in the past okay and so some people are asking how big the paper nautilus was here this female oh, okay yeah how big was it um i would say two centimeters wide uh, maximum two centimeters yeah. Yeah. the biggest one i've heard can be like maybe five to eight centimeters but that's the biggest one the most are like tiny right Exactly. Yeah. So the most paper nautilus, or I can only speak from Anilao from the Philippines, maybe it's somewhere else. It's, it's different, uh, but I've only seen them there. Um, it goes up from maybe half a centimeter, a few millimeters up to two and a half, three centimeters, I would say is the most common size for it. The bigger, the better for the photography, of course. Um, but I, I read in Wikipedia, you can read, read about this paper nautilus. They can grow up up to 30 centimeters even, uh, but I haven't seen those yet. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, we, I've got my first one in Raja Ampat, so they are everywhere, but you have to be very lucky to get them. Eh? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I love this one. Um, <clears throat> the next image is um, also from a blackwater dive, but um, this was a not so good blackwater dive um, because it's just a regular reef squid, what you can see here. And um, I took the chance to test some more camera settings in this case. So I um, had basically the same settings I had before for my blackwater dive, but I changed my shutter speed to one second to get all the nice, um, the background, the green in the background is actually the light from the line, from the blackwater dive line. And the left shadow of the squid is the squid actually moving through the, through the image. Yeah? So you can be very creative in terms of long, um, shutter settings also in black water in the night photography and this is what I want to say even if something is boring or if you maybe have a boring dive where no unicorn maybe appears which is usually the case then you can also be creative and go for some other techniques or some other um, photography yeah so I think here also or in general the most important point is to try all your settings and not be afraid that this is the one setting which is then correct for everything um, it's not that easy, unfortunately, yes, it can be, all the settings can be nice as the most important thing in photography is the result. And nobody will ask you um, what you did for this or why are the settings like this if the result is pretty nice, even if you change the rules or if you break the rules. So this is with the second shutter, right? One second, yeah, one second. One second, but rear, rear shutter or, or rear curtain, you call it in Canon, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's the second curtain or rear curtain or however you would call it. So there's, of course, the curtain is opening, the shutter is opening from the camera and usually at the same time, the strobe is also flashing. Um, but here, if I put it on the second curtain, um, the camera will expose and only at the end, at the rear curtain, at the second curtain, um, just before the, the, the shutter closes, the camera will um, flash the strobes. And this with this technique, you get this um, floating. Yeah? But you can also... 
this will also go to, to explain this in detail. We'll go over the time that I need another 30 minutes just to explain the, <laughs> the second and first Are curtain. you using two lights or one light? Because one the, light from the top, one yeah, light. one focus light. Okay. Uh, but two strobes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> and also here, um, the next picture is also was an experiment, and I was experimenting not with the trio plan lens, which um, I was already referring to with the special lens which creates the bubbles, but with an artificial background, actually. So I was trying out with several techniques of backgrounds and do different things to give an image a different look. Um, and I was here in Lembe and of, before in Bali, or I was a long time in Indonesia in this case, and I had several backgrounds and also constructed them by my own um, to get this bubble effect or this bubble bouquet for the background. And um, this black hairy frogfish was uh, really nice, or actually not so nice because it moved all the time. Um, but um, I finally could do a really nice picture or different image, how it would usually be from um, a common black hairy frogfish. And this is one. I want to give as well as inspiration, maybe do things differently, yeah, like others would do, maybe, yeah, or not. Um, I think it's good to copy images as well, like to photograph it in an exact way to learn, to learn the technique, but then go a step ahead or go a step forward, I mean, and uh, to do and to create your own style and look for images. And this is what I did here in this case. Yeah, you remember two years ago, I asked you uh, to give me this or let me use this photo in our workshop. And we all tried to, uh, well, not copy, but inspired by it, do something similar. It's still very difficult, but it's, I mm -hmm. think it's, it, you shouldn't be shy. If you see a great image like this, try to work your way into that direction and learn how the effect works. And maybe you'll find your own way. We, uh, we looked at your, uh, this one and you had another one of a cuttlefish and then everybody mm -hmm. had different ideas and try to yeah. yeah just to get inspired by it so um, yeah. yeah i think but, but this is exactly what i wanted to say with this yeah to get inspired and then and this is i think the fun part to get behind the idea and to create something similar it would have been so easy for me already when i did the series to tell everybody how i did it and which background i used but then everybody would just copy it and didn't think about it by um, her or himself um, how to create it and now because i'm not saying it because um, many, many people are already asking me what exactly I did for this background. And I don't want to say it just because of the reason, because then you stop thinking about it. And if you think about it, how to create it is, then you you get further or you get, you know what I mean? It's, it's much more worth it if you get to the solution by yourself than to just somebody tells it to you. You, know? you learn much more with this. So I think that's the great thing if you're going to a macro destination because you can practice different things. So, you know, you can say, okay, this time I'm going to bring this background and that background. I'm just going to try around with that in, in Lembe or Anilao. You, you have the time to play like this, exactly, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So sorry, guys, we're not telling you what the background uh, is made of, but uh, <laughs> something that reflects light. <laughs> yeah. No, not, not, no, not that's even? actually not true. No, no. <laughs> take it back. No, take no, back. no reflection of light. <laughs> no reflection of light. Okay. I'll tell you later, Simon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is also an example um, of a shot which is pure luck, actually. Um, I have to say this, and this is always a mix of being prepared to create something, and also it comes together to, with luck. And in this situation, I was just working, uh, waiting for, sorry, waiting for another photographer, not the one who's in the picture, but another one who's more further down on the rack, um, until he was finished. And then suddenly this huge moral eel, um, just, I was sitting in a door or waiting like next to a door and it was coming behind me and just a few centimeters away from my head, from behind me going forward actually. And I was trying to tell the other photographers like, take a picture, take a picture, yeah? because he was, the more eel was, freely swimming into the wreck and he wouldn't react he was just like sitting and watching the memorial so i was like okay then i'm doing the shot yeah so i was swimming a bit forward and just took a few shots ne didn't check my, my my settings in that moment and i was looking after this the the memorial was then out of the out of the way or swimming away checking my images and then luckily um, i had one or two pictures which are really nice um especially with all the background as well um on it yeah? so it's like this is actually almost the raw picture. So I had just one strobe on the top. Uh, my fisheye lens was on 
And there was um, this creates also this slight vignette. This um, you can see that not the whole rack is lightened. Um, the left and the right part is a little bit darker. And this is why, because I had only one strobe to light it everything up. But it was purposely done for this effect that I have like a little natural vignette around the um, image to um, make the effect even more dramatic for the middle or for the center of the image. So this was the reason. And this was just pure luck. I had the right settings. And maybe I checked them a little bit, yeah, to fix it. Maybe the, 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 the time, the shutter speed a little bit to get more background, um, ambient light from the background, but that's it. I'm going to ask you a question that Angelina asked earlier. I was going to put yeah. it at the end, but it fits here very well. You say, she said, she's asking, how much time do you spend with the subjects you photograph? It looks like all your winning photographs are luck. <laughs> uh, no, no, this I, I have to decline because um, the rack pictures, for example, uh, did win a lot. And there's also one rack image coming at the end of the presentation, which gave me the biggest title, I would say, or the biggest photo contest win. So um, this was preparation work. Yeah, but some, of course, I would say you can pre be prepared 80%. And then at the last 20%, you need a little bit of not luck, maybe, but that the animal is playing with you or interacting with you and showing you the behavior. So you need to spend some time underwater also with an animal um, sometimes to just get the shot, yeah, to spend some time. But also at the same time, it's really um, like you need to find a balance to also have respect for the, for the animals. Like for example, the humpback whale, this was maybe half an hour in encounter and I felt at the end, okay, the animal was too curious for example it came very close so i want to leave the animal so you need to find the right way where you say mm, this is maybe not comfortable for the for the for the animal for the subject anymore and to leave it as well yeah with the time and then come back at another time and try to be, be, be more prepared um get the settings faster maybe get the shot what you want faster and then you then you're better prepared for the next time yeah i think it's a good answer <laughs> <laughs> um also with this shot, um, I put it here in the presentation because I like it because I shot a regular anemone fish um, in its anemone with a snoot. And this is what you usually probably not would do. You just have your two strobes and you would highlight the whole um, anemone, which is also nice. But I think this effect is quite nice with the snoot sometimes um, to make it even more dramatic or better or to even focus more on the subject, what you, on the subject what you want to have. So also to give you more idea to, ex I like the snoot very much um, to, to experiment as well with light, especially in all those macro destinations. Southeast Asia, of course, is perfect for this. In Lao or Philippines or um, Lembe or also in Rajan, but you can do so much macro stuff. And if you're a little bit creative, if you think a little bit about the light, then you can do a lot of stuff, which is different to, to other pictures. You just have to be careful you don't over snoot. We sometimes have, yes, exactly. and you do like three dives only, everything is black, everything is black and then, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So this is also like all other techniques. If you overdo a specific techniques, I would say you also get boring with this, yeah. Um, but this is also the same. Um, or if your portfolio, or let's take it in another way, if your portfolio looks most diverse, um, then it's a very good portfolio. So you have maybe one macro image, one shark, one whale, one dolphin, one wreck, one wide angle, a few nice wide angle corns, but not like um, 10 sharks and 10 dolphins in your portfolio. Even if those are your best shots, it doesn't make a good portfolio. And the same with the snoots. If you come back from a destination, if all your pictures look like uh, with black background, I think it's also a little bit boring maybe. Yeah? So if you try to get um, like some pattern shots, as I showed you before, like this one, um, into the into it, or also some fish, some more eels, yeah, or a fish like this into the into the portfolio. Then your portfolio is much more worth than just similar shots. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we're coming to an end now slowly, um, but this is also an example from my iceberg series, um, which I was originally planning actually. Um, to shoot some icebergs with a diver. And luckily this diver underneath the iceberg had two video lights with him. And this shot, for example, I planned um, because I was seeing him doing, going there with the video lights and I liked the effect just by seeing it. And the next time when we were at the surface for a stop, I said, okay, can you the next dive we're doing together, can you please one time go underneath the iceberg and put your 
lamps up to the iceberg to, to show or to highlight the, to light the bottom of the iceberg. And this was a planned shot. And this already also won one contest um, already uh, recently. So it's not only luck, which, which, which makes my images. And also I have to say, coming to this point with the luck, um, even though the animal is swimming in the right way, on the correct way, you have to still make the picture, I have to say, yeah? And you have to have the correct settings for it. Um, you have to have the patience and the experience and the calmness also to shoot and to frame it in a nice way. And this is also, it's not only luck, it's also the skills, I think, of a photographer, not only me, but also Simon does a lot of very, very nice images as well. I can see this, yeah, superb images, actually. And um, this is not too much luck. It's also skills of photographers who are actually then triggering, uh, putting half, who have to uh, put down the finger on the shutter in the right moment, in the right frame, and only the, and with the right settings at the end to be able to capture what you're seeing. Well, that's very nice of you to uh, to give me this compliment. But when I see this picture, it's like one of my favorites from you. It's just so perfect because it's, you know, it's got the form and the roundness. It's almost like you're seeing a whole planet hovering over this human. I mean, this is, is such a strong photo. Um, that's not just Thank about you. being in the ice. It's you've got the specific vision that you that you find these forms to freeze them into a photo, I think is a uh, you know, makes makes your photos very unique. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Yeah. But it's also, um, you can learn to, I mean, it's the eye of a photographer, you usually say, who makes the pictures or have, who have this in mind. Of course, I had this picture in mind, what I wanted to take. Um, and everybody can learn this. Yeah, I was not, of course, I was not starting with these kind of images and I'm still learning. And the more you spend time with underwater photography, as you're doing now, and the more you um, look at other images which you like I think you also you learn more about your own photography and the way how you want to shoot images yeah? so it's a it's a process of course yeah the more you shoot the more you're into the topic the more you um, get to know about other pictures or to see other pictures which are quite good the better you will be as well at one point of time so next time I'm with a, with an iceberg, now I have a better idea what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah this could be. Of course, I, yeah. yet, I still but... have, I still have a lot of pictures in mind that could could be better. Um, for example, this one. Yeah. So um, I know this was winning um, the underwater photographer of the year contest in 2018, uh, which I was very happy about it, of course, but. Uh, Immediately after I shot this one, I already knew how to make it even better, um, but I didn't do it yet. <laughs> and not what, I mean, this already won the biggest contest which we have in the world for the photography maybe. So no need to, yeah, <laughs> to do this image better actually. But there's always a way, there's always things that can be better in an image. Um, this is, I think no image is perfect. Um, but um, yeah, luckily this image won me that uh, contest. Uh, which is also a panoramic image, which was the first panoramic image I did inside the rack. And this was inside the Sisselgorm. This is maybe the most famous rack in, in Egypt and one of the most famous racks in the world, I would say, um, because it was um, uh, sunk or it sunk in the fight in the Second World War in 1940. Um, two, I think, or one, um, no, I forgot the, the exact year, doesn't matter. But um, the most important thing about this wreck is that it had um, trucks and motorcycles as the cargo, as supplies for the British Army um, in this case. And this is super special to, to dive with, um, especially in these waters. As almost, um, I, don't, I almost don't know any other wreck who has this kind of cargo um, or this special way of cargo else also combined with, um, quite nice visibilities also inside the rack because there's a constant flow of current also going through it. Unfortunately, um, the rack is already since the last 50 years quite ripped you know, or like since last, no, I have to correct here, since the last 30 years, there were a lot of, because it was only rediscovered in the early 90s, um, this rack, but from this time on, people began to steal things from the rack. Yeah, that means like, um, driving wheels or uh, instruments from the from the cars from the motorcycles and so on so you don't have the same um, rack 
unfortunately any longer, but still some nice perspectives, I would say, which you can find. And especially with a combination of putting lights into different um, spots, like here in the truck uh, wheels, on the wheelhouse of the, of the truck on the left side, or also on the um, cargo deck of the truck, um, I would say, or the, the um, how you call it, the trunk of, the, of one of the trucks. I put some video lights in, also Keldan lights, quite strong ones in this time. And then I was trying to get this um, image was what, and I spent one complete dive to just get this specific image, um, I have to say as well. Yeah. So I had this image in mind, it was planned um, before because I was diving a few years before also on the same wreck. I took the same angle, the same shot um, in this case, but I was not happy about it. So, and uh, I had the idea to create a panorama exactly from the same perspective and the next time when I'm visiting or I have the chance to visit the wreck. So I did, yeah. So I had the idea in mind while looking at home through my images, like, okay, this is, I'm not so super happy with this kind of image. Um, let's do it better. And I did. And luckily it was also chosen yeah, by the judges. We had earlier some questions. Um, actually, they came afterwards about the other one with the wreck. So you setting up all the lights yourself or do you have like pe people helping you set up the lights? Yeah, no, I do everything by myself. Um, and this is sometimes the biggest struggle uh, because I usually have also groups, I told you, to lead um, through the racks as well. And I'm placing some lights for my workshop participants as well um, so that they can shoot a specific image. So uh, one image we have left out, um, I was jumping over it because we are so late, but this is, for example, a very famous um, rack, uh, motorcycle in the Sisseldorm as well. And... Um, um, I'm placing the lights so that the participants or the workshop participants can quickly get to this kind of image um, as well. And then I only, myself, only have very little time to spend inside the rack as well to place it for, my, for myself, actually, the lights. But on this particular dive with this rack, um, it was a dive without guests, so I could do my own thing, luckily, in this case, and do the, do the picture. And um, um, I, don't, I'm not, I was not disturbed. Um, also by other divers. But sometimes, or if you do this, <laughs> one, one thing um, here, or one, one little tip as well, if you're placing a lot of lights, and usually I have, or you can see also in the next picture, usually I have a few lights with me, uh, not only six like in this picture, but usually, sometimes I have eight or ten um, lights with me um, on my BCD clipped in, and then I uh, try to um, place them everywhere. And the thing is, if other divers come along the same way, then some people are actually stealing you the, the light. This is no joke, yeah? So they, I don't know what they think, but I'm waiting there like three meters away until they pass and the light is on and they grab it, turn it off and clip it on their own BCD. And I have to swim to them and say, what the, what the beep, 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 yeah? Uh, what are you doing, yeah? This is my light, just leave it there, yeah? Um, so you have to be really careful, um, watch the, your lights, what, where you're placing. And sometimes um, you can also, lose them easily yeah so also in the next picture you can see that there are a lot of places where the light can fall into yeah so i recommend here a little um, gorilla pot for every light also with a like a little um uh, shell here or like a little um, um assembling so you can fix it onto the onto the gorilla pot i would say and then uh, play with the light like this so it doesn't get lost um, as well yeah or lost by other divers <laughs> <laughs> philippe is saying for free lights, just come on a trip with Tobias because you can just pick yeah. up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but I also I borrow the my lights to other divers or also other participants, and I know that one participant is also here. He also had the same problem that the light has been not or was that one other diver from another boat was trying to steal one of his lights. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's really not cool. Hey, one more question, sorry, on the on the panorama stitch, because I was wondering that too, Angelina just asked that, uh, because you have so many fish in there, like, wasn't that yeah. difficult to stitch? I mean, how did you even stitch that? Um, <clears throat> of that course, um, yeah, Lightroom does a really nice job to merge the image together, but um, good, good question, actually. Um, if you have a lot of small details like this fish you have to go into if you want you stitched your your panorama together in, in lightroom and you did all the settings what you need then i usually export the Im the image in photoshop and then go in very detail in 100 or 200 percent view 
over this image and to see if there are any defects in it. And then I try to correct them with uh, Photoshop with a small tools, with a copying tool or so. I'm trying to merge them better together. So this is needed. And also to remove the backscatter a little bit, of course, which you have in almost every picture. Patrick is asking another good question. Are panoramas allowed in competitions? Well, he won the biggest competition that we have with it. So the answer is probably yes, but I'll let uh, Tobias say a bit more about that. <laughs> yeah, I was um, wondering about this as well, because it's not one photo, it's a several photos, but I think it's okay. Um, or they let it pass because they were also panoramic images in the past or stitched images in the past in big competitions from racks, but more from the outside. I haven't seen so many from the inside. And I think because it's just one scene, yeah, I didn't, this is not a collage. Yeah. So I, this is, this is the photo or the view, what you get inside this cargo deck in the Sisselgom. I didn't um, put, edit any fish to it. I would never do this. I never add anything to my images. They are not collages. They are shot like this. The view was like this. Maybe I removed maybe a fin from a diver that I didn't see when I was looking through the viewfinder of my camera, when I took, so I took the picture or something like this, or, whatever, like these small retouched things, yeah, which don't affect the general view of the image, but, um, and, and still are, but are still a little bit like a defect to the image. Yeah? So it's only very, very little work here and they are removing the particles like the backscatter, um, stitching it really together. So I think I can be really say that all my images are taken like it was there in this moment. And this is, I think the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the end, it's, it's what makes the winning photo is if it's convincing, they, they will not yeah. mind if it's, if it's a stitch or an assembly or whatever, if you're creating something that impresses everybody, then the jurors will be much more forgiving. Definitely. You cannot mm -hmm. add anything. That's the exactly. Yeah. But there was always a rule in competitions where I was also worried a little bit about it and I didn't like it. I have to say, because in Nikon, Nikon cameras, um, I think you can still do it. I don't have, I have a Canon. I use Canon since, I don't know, 15 years. So I'm not so familiar with Nikon. But uh, in Nikon, you can um, do a double exposure of images. So that means you can, for example, photograph a nice macro um, photo with a snood and the black background, for example, and then um, expose or select another image which you took before, for example, of a sky or like re really nice, um, sun rays um, going down from the surface also with the black surrounding maybe and stitch them together and this shot can't be achieved with a regular lens or in one shot these are two different like lenses even yeah where you can achieve the shot and they put it together in the shot and they are even still many many contests or many pictures are winning uh, with this technique which I don't like so much because this is a collage you can do easily you can do this easily in Photoshop in one minute but this is not allowed in the contest. But if you do it in camera, then it's suddenly allowed. And I don't like this point. Um, so either you do one or the other. Yeah? Even you're allowed uh, with Photoshop or without, but you can't. This is just a benefit from Nikon or was in the past, but um, in a few years. And this is, for me, it's a collage, definitely. Yeah? I think Photoshop. it's quite nice when they have a category where everything is allowed. You know, if you exactly, want to yeah. use mm -hmm. any technique, any editing, <clears throat> whatever, put it into a, you know, creative category, but don't let it, you know, overpower natural images. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm coming to an end. Actually, this was the last image I'm shown, I would do some um, other information, which I um, like to share with you or with everybody at the end, but any more questions to the images, maybe? I'm keeping a couple of questions to the very end. So when we just uh, are done mm -hmm. with the slides, I've got not specific to the images, more general questions. I have a few. Okay, yeah. Um, I have the presentation, as you know, Simon, is still going on a little bit, but I would like to skip the last part um, yeah. and to maybe skip it for next time, yeah, because we are really over time now. Just so go, I would to the, go to, to your page and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as some of you know already, I'm also doing or wrote a few books about underwater photography. I'm also doing um, calendars every year. Um, as you can see, the book has been published in German, but also in English and in Chinese. I don't have the Chinese book with me. I can't sell it to you. It's available on the, on the Chinese market, but the English book I have, if you want one, I can send you also one with a signature. Just send me an email afterwards or a quick note um, somewhere. 
and also I'm doing calendars and also books about underwater photography. And super, super new, you are the first ones that actually know this. Yeah, Simon knows this already, and only I think a couple of other guys know this that I'm working on this. But in the future, um, there will be um, Lightroom presets from me. So I will offer them to sell. Um, ready Lightroom settings and maybe I'm also doing a webinar about those uh, in the future to explain how to use them but I think it's um, if you're a little bit struggling with Lightroom and don't know how your settings uh, coming really good along in your images or like that your images not getting really the flavor what you want I think I can guide you really nicely to get really really nice images for um, in Lightroom with those presets. I think it's a really nice step, especially if you don't know Lightroom so good um, with these settings. Um, I think I can help you a lot. Yeah. I thought you would be ready by now, but um, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> almost, again. almost, yeah. When I hope... Not, um, when it's ready, I can send an email to everybody who's here and then uh, they can get the link that, to the... That would be perfect, Simon. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so I hope that by um, end of next week, I can send, uh, so in one week, maybe, um, I can send out the first um, Lightroom presets. Cool. Um, and you're always um, also happy. I'm still looking for people who are testing this. Yeah, so um, if anybody wants to contact me about this, then please send me an email and I will have to choose probably uh, a few who are testing these uh, this, this Lightroom um, presets for me. I can give you a few people as well, if you like. Yeah, thank you, yeah. And you're also welcome to have a look on my website, which uh, will be also, um, or which, which is under construction at the moment, or there will be a new website um, soon, um, but only in one month or so, I guess. Um, but if you go to my website under join, there are all my workshops and all my group trips um, um, as well listed. So if you want to have a look into these um, and check it, I'm also posting a picture with, which I took with a Sea Life camera every week on my um, Facebook page and also on the Sea Life cameras Instagram page. So with a little tip and trick and also with all the settings. So if you want to, um, you can have a look there um, as well. Um, I can also strongly recommend you the book which Alex Mustard did actually. I'm a big fan of Alex Mustard as well. Um, and um, if you want to go a bit further also in, in underwater photography, then his book is also really, really good. Um, just to let you know as well about other recommendations as well. But also I would be happy if you would follow me on YouTube, Facebook or on Instagram. I would be really happy about it. That's it from my side. <laughs> cool. Well, let me just uh, ask a few questions. We've literally only lost four people, even though we're over okay. 30 minutes over. So you can see that cool, you have huh? a very uh, uh, capturing way of talking to people and showing amazing photos. Um, just go one back to the photo of Alex Mustard, uh, the, the Alex Mustard's uh, book, um, because somebody earlier asked what the recommendation is, how to enter um, uh, underwater photography and when you started did you read books or did you just experiment? Um, good question actually. Um, when the time when I started there were not so many underwater books, um, underwater photography books I have to say. I was starting about when um, when the internet was coming up a little bit as well, or not when the internet was coming up, but all these forums and exchanging opinions over the internet was, was rising a little bit. So I read a little bit in the internet, but um, I would say it was a mix about reading a, about underwater photography in magazines, looking at images, also taking part in underwater photography workshops. I did that in 2009 with a German underwater photographer to get myself better, which was really good to practice it as well. Um, but it's also experience, of course. Yeah. So the more you dive, the more you photograph, it's better. But if you want to really get better in, in underwater photography, I would recommend you a mix of books um, about more beginner books and more advanced books, I would say, and to participate in underwater workshops because the theory is good. But what I got from my participants is the most valuable thing in underwater photo workshops is the... Um, I, I'm doing every night, I'm doing like a photo critic session where everybody could send in one or two or give me before um, one or two pictures and I'm speaking about the images and also working on with them Lightroom and talking about this and that and what you could have done better maybe, which was good in the picture, which was not so good, how the lights could have been. And this is really 
worth to participate in an underwater workshop, I would say, to learn about your own photography and that somebody else is talking about your picture and all the others who are listening are also learning from this. Yeah? So this is what I got the, as a feedback from my participants. This is the most valuable thing in a photo workshop. And the good thing is that you can immediately do it better afterwards or the next day. Yeah? So if you say, ah, okay, this was not so good. Okay, I'm trying it again. Yeah? So this is there you learn, I think, the most. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's very good to point out. It's it, you have to do a lot of work and try the different techniques. But if you join a yeah. workshop with somebody like like Tobias, then you can really shortcut a lot. A lot of the learning yes. that he has done, um, you can shortcut. So I can only strongly recommend any any good photographer who does workshops where we really focus on on training. You can fast forward your learning tremendously. Um, yes. Let me just pick a couple of questions that we had over the, if that's okay, yeah, we'll just do a couple. Of course. Um, sorry guys, if you're not getting all the photos, uh, all the questions that you've asked, I'm sorry, I'm just going to pick a few. Um, I, I like the one that I just saw here by James, uh, who said, how do you approach competitions? Um, do you just choose from your library or do you have a specific subject idea in mind? How do you stand out? Not, not an easy uh, answer maybe, but... Um, just, uh, <laughs> yeah, good, but good question. Yeah. Um, so sometimes, as I maybe said already, I have some pictures in mind, like the um, uh, panoramic of the Sisselgorm, which I did, which I knew before. If this is going to be a good picture, then I would send it into photo competitions. So this could be a good preparation for photo competitions that I'm. Um, I mean, I'm anyway working the whole year underwater as an underwater photographer, so I get into many or more situations, fortunately, um, which could be nice as a, for, for a contest picture. But usually I'm not um, specifically working for photo contests. This is not my main argument. I'm trying to get an underwater picture as good as possible and not minding the photo competition. It's not in my head that, I'm, that when I'm photographing something that, oh, I have to get this into a photo competition. It's more like, I'm shooting and just trying to get the best out of the situation or the best out of the moment. And then afterwards, if I can, I check it on the computer and I see it, I can see, okay, this is maybe a contest um, picture or I can send it into the contests. But then at the end of the year or when the contests are coming up, I can still go through the portfolio. I see which categories the, contests, the contest has. And then I'm selecting my images along with this. Yeah? So it's like, okay, maybe... And I'm not sending in too much images, yeah? So if the wide angle category, I may be sending in one or two images only, yeah? Macro category, one or two images only, because I think these are the best ones, which I took during the year maybe, and then I'm sent them in, yeah? And you can't, um, it's a good, contests are good and important, I think, to, for you or for you as a photographer to see in which stage you are, if you're winning contests or if you're, maybe become becoming a lot of honorable mentions or even not recognized yeah so it gives you a little bit of good recognition where you are and how good you are as an underwater photographer but the exact um places like who's becoming first second or third it's always a gamble i have to say it's always so much relying on judges opinions and i'm also myself judging um photo competitions and about the photo competitions and i maybe have another opinion and i maybe like another uh, one picture more than another judge and um, because i haven't seen it so far or i haven't seen it yet or um, I like this specific way. So all the opinions about pictures are so different that you can't really rely on an opinion. So for me, a contest, if I win something, I'm happy, I'm nice, but I'm also happy to lose and say, okay, uh, next time maybe maybe there is another chance for something. Yeah? So never get, uh, give up is here the, the, the ground topic, I would say, and always try and try and try to be better. And um, just look at your images and your favorite images and look at them critical and see what, ca what could have, could, could I have done better, maybe, and do it the next time if you can, yeah? Or if not, then try to do it with another subject, yeah? So um, I want to ask a question that Massimo asked, um, that is, uh, you know, Massimo Zanini is also a photographer. Yeah. He's, asking, <laughs> um, he's asking about uh, green lights uh, in reef colors. So like a lot of the split shots have green colors in the reef is that on purpose or is that something that's a style or yeah i would say um that's not it's not a green light maybe you think this one but it's like how i set up the white balance and i would 
I, and I've seen it underwater and uh, maybe some other people would put in more blue or more other colors, but I like it in this way the most. Yeah? And this is also um, about Lightroom or about Photoshop in general. Um, you have to develop your picture in a way that you like it. And this is because we, and we have all different styles. We all have different eyes. We all have different opinions on how a picture should look like, but I didn't use any green lights for this. It's just the white balance is different maybe to, to other pictures or what the, or how the camera would have interpreted this specific color in this way. But I saw it like this and I liked it the most like this actually. So um, then I have a question from Angelina that actually Yasmin answered because Yasmin is, <laughs> is the, the chief editor of the Europe's biggest magazine Tauchen and where uh, Tobias has been working with for many years. Angelina was asking, <laughs> Uh, how, what is your advice on starting contributing my work to magazines as someone who's never published before? And Yasmin said, just send them. So uh, <laughs> I think that's a really good advice. If you have good photos or good articles, just go to the magazines, look where the editing department is. Uh, there's always an email. And as you can see, Yasmin is uh, open to any one of you uh, submitting your, uh, your work directly to, to the magazines. But if you want to add maybe for Angelina some more tips, uh, Tobias. Yeah, the biggest tip is shoot as good as you can. Yeah, The better the images are, the more happy the magazines are, uh, are to print them. Yeah. Try to do something unique, I think, is, is, is also helpful. Yeah, yeah unique uh, or from destinations that never have been published. Yeah, something specific. Yeah, I know that the first story I did in Greenland was uh, really nice from, from the, the feedback from the magazines because they haven't seen something like this before. I never had an article from Greenland before. So any specific or location which is um, different to everybody, everything else. But you also need to get some good pictures from this location. Yeah, so it's not only the location what matters it's the mix yeah and um i think this could be another webinar to talk about how to get into magazines and what to shoot for magazines right yeah <laughs> okay um actually earlier tina asked um if you have recommendations for greenland in terms of operators like to dive with i guess Do you uh, yes a... because there's only one operator <laughs> and this is northern explorers uh you, if you google it then uh, you find them, but I know that they are booked out for the next years already yeah, for for Greenland um, at the moment because this is because many um, people, more and more people, more and more divers coming out to Greenland as well um, to dive there, and um, it's very um, and ask the question uh, the, the the this destination now yeah it's very modern now I would say on the divers. Um, I would uh, like to actually just read out, I don't know if everybody's watching the Q&A, so Yasmin actually just answered also her part to the, uh, to the part that uh, I asked by, uh, for Angeline. And Yasmin is saying, try to tell a story with the pictures, and I'm yes. very happy that, yeah. uh, that uh, you say that, because I think all of uh, Tobias's uh, pictures have a lot of layers, a lot of levels. There's a lot to see in a photograph, and that is story, and uh, maybe, that, uh, clo maybe to, to close uh, from from our side because we're trying to practice as well and I always think story is really important and technology is one thing and you might not be able to afford the rig like a professional but if you think like a professional in terms of trying to convey a story then you've really got a, a great opportunity of even with normal equipment getting very good shots um, yeah. and you can take inspiration by many of his photos um, are, are not necessarily because it's equipment it's just mindset right yeah. And it's also important to just add one more point to not only photograph the underwater world, but also if you want to do a story for a magazine, you also need to photograph, for example, the dive boat where you're diving on or the resort or people who are going to the boat or on the boat enjoying it. Yeah. So it's like so much more for to photograph for a story. It's not only underwater images which are counting for a story. It's also the people that are actually diving there are also important. Yeah. Um, so guys, I'm just gonna uh, just say a couple uh, things uh, before we uh, say goodbye to Tobias. Um, I just want to say that we have a lot of cool talks coming up. Um, Elke Boyanowski, also a German who is a scientist in the Red Sea, is going to talk about oceanic white tips specifically, more from a conservation angle, as well as Andy Cornish will speak next week about uh, conservation of sharks and rays. He's the World Wildlife Fund uh, responsible for sharks and rays. So these are two sort of shark conservation talks you shouldn't miss. 
Um, also, we've got next week uh, Nico Deutsch, uh, also a German guy, uh, videographer. He was also here in the audience. And uh, he's going to talk about underwater video basics. So uh, from beginning to uh, editing all that, we have our tech insider, Phil Christoph, talking about how to get into tech and what things are relevant uh, for you to think about. Also, Peter Hauk is going to talk about coral conservation. So we have a lot of good stuff, guys. Please look at insideracademy.com. That's where I list all of our webinars. Um, also, you can find us on Facebook and YouTube and everywhere with Insider Divers. And now I would like to everybody together say thank you very much to Tobias Friedrich for this amazing talk. Um, this was really uh, inspirational and I think uh, from seeing the comments from everybody, you've done a fantastic job, uh, Tobias. Uh, really, really well done where the messages are pouring in. Everybody's really grateful. We've uh, done two hours. We've never done two hours before and almost nobody dropped out. Um, so really, I would say fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. Probably the best one we've had and uh, really grateful that you came. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, Simon. Yeah, it was a pleasure. <laughs> cool. All right, guys, thank you very much. <laughs>